My name is Dan Crane. I'm a biology professor at Wright State University, and I get involved in court cases where DNA evidence is involved. Forensic science is an interesting discipline. It's uh, essentially, uh, the word forensic means as applied in a court of law. And so forensic science is science as it plays out in court cases, typically criminal trials. DNA is an abbreviation for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a chemical uh, that we keep in our cells and uh, it's easiest, it's best to think of it as an information storage molecule. So DNA has an alphabet of just four letters. There are only four chemicals that get strung together to make a DNA molecule. And it's the order in which those chemicals are arranged, those letters get arranged, that spells out the blueprints that our bodies use to make us who we are, to give us arms and legs, to determine what our eye color is, to determine how tall we are, and, and even to determine things like our preferences for foods and the color clothing we like to wear. So our bodies are made of many trillions of cells. Pretty much every one of those cells has a perfect copy of our DNA instructions. Um, the test kits that crime laboratories use to generate DNA profiles are designed to work best with about 100 cells worth of DNA. And we're shedding DNA and cells all the time without giving it a second thought. A single fingerprint will have on the order of 100 cells. A single fingerprint is plenty enough DNA uh, within it to be able to generate a very reliable, very distinctive DNA profile. And so that sensitivity is actually a double-edged sword, right? Um, because DNA, it's a chemical, it can persist for a very long time. You, I could leave a fingerprint on a tabletop and three weeks later, it could get picked up as part of a crime scene investigation um, without my having been anywhere near a crime right, that had actually taken place. Uh, but by the same token, if I'm committing a crime, uh, it's virtually impossible for me to not leave behind at that crime scene some of my DNA. And so the question becomes then, you know, how, how, what significance should we attach to the finding of a DNA profile? And it kind of comes down to this. It's important for for jurors and judges to bear in mind that the presence of a DNA profile doesn't tell us anything about how or when the DNA came to be there. It might help to, to bear in mind just how tiny the amounts of DNA are that these tests are working with. Again, our bodies are made of trillions of cells. A single cell will have within it about six and a half picograms of DNA. A picogram is a trillionth of a gram. Biologists don't often think about trillionths. In a packet of sugar, right, that's usually one gram, sometimes two grams of sugar. A packet of sugar will have maybe one or two thousand crystals of sugar within it. Each one of those crystals weighs a milligram. It's a thousandth of a gram. If you cut one of those crystals up a thousand times, each of those tiny pieces would be a millionth of a gram or a microgram. And if you cut up a microgram a thousand times, you would have a nanogram, which is a billionth of a gram. And if you cut up one of those pieces a thousand times, you would have a picogram, which is a trillionth of a gram. So it's a thousandth of a thousandth of a thousandth of a thousandth of a gram. Tiny, vanishingly small amounts of material, way, way too small to be seen with a naked eye. And yet, left behind at a crime scene, it can give rise to really powerful statistics that say there's a one in a quintillion chance that somebody else's DNA is what was found at that crime scene. So I've never taken sugar and put it into my hand just for the fun of it. <laughs> so we have all that sugar. Yeah, you got a lot of sugar. There. Yeah, so in theory, this is representing DNA, correct? Yep. So then I'd like meet you and say, yeah. hey, nice to meet you, sir. Sounds How are good. you doing today? Hey, look at that. There's some sugar on my hand. 
and it transferred. So you've transferred something to me, and now if I were to pick up a pen, you can see there's a little bit of sugar there, and there's a little bit of sugar on these scissors now as well for my having uh, picked those up. And yet, you never touched these scissors. Correct, so now that's placed me potentially at a crime scene. If that sugar was your DNA, and where that sugar was, there will also be DNA. Um, I've got your sugar, and I've got your DNA on my hand, and now we've got your sugar and your DNA on the handle of this pair of scissors and on that pen. And now if we leave this at a crime scene, you've got some explaining to do. <laughs> <laughs>「I see myself primarily as a teacher, right? I, that's what I really enjoy. I love teaching. I love seeing the light bulbs come on uh, with students as I'm talking with them about a cool concept in a class. And it's very helpful for me professionally as a DNA profiling expert to have that experience of talking with high school students and incoming college freshmen, because those are the same kind of people that sit on juries in terms of their understanding and their backgrounds. And it's fun for me to be able to share with them that, that passion and those insights and see those light bulbs, not just that come on for the students that I teach, but also to the jurors. And so I don't mind saying the same thing as many times as it takes for those light bulbs to come on. I typically will teach the introductory freshman biology course for the, those individuals who are intending to major in really any of the sciences, but particularly biology. And uh, the course's name is Cells, Genes, and Genetics. And so we, we start actually with a crash course in chemistry and work our way up through uh, macromolecules like proteins and DNA, and then ultimately start talking about genetics, how it is that uh, genes get passed from one generation to the next. Uh, but in addition to that, I do teach a forensic DNA profiling course um, for juniors and seniors who are interested in learning a little bit more about that kind of work. And I'll tell you, the students who take that class end up being pretty well trained to be DNA analysts, but I don't see that course so much as a course on how to do DNA profiling as it is a course on how to, to build up your muscles to do critical thinking, to, to look critically at test results and conclusions that have been drawn by experts and see if you really believe it or not. Is, does it pass the, the, a critical thinking test? DNA is a chemical. Um, as far as chemicals go, it's actually a pretty stable chemical. It, it persists for a long time. It's been possible to get DNA off of mail bags that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid bled on uh, during train robberies from over 100 years ago. It's even possible to get DNA off of, uh, you know, human remains that have been buried in peat bogs for 5,000 years. Right, so it's, you know, DNA can last a very long time. DNA profiles get generated by these commercially available test kits. Um, and so there's some chemistry involved with amplifying up just the parts of a person's DNA that are likely to be different from one person to another. That ultimately is what we want to look at to help us distinguish between one person's DNA and another person's DNA. Um, the way that those test results actually get visualized is through electropherograms. And so the DNA, after it gets amplified, the fragments of DNA get separated on the basis of their size through a process called capillary electrophoresis. And an instrument then captures little flashes of light as these fragments of DNA move through the capillary tubes as they're being separated by size. And those flashes of light then get recorded on graphs that we call electropherograms. And so a peak on one of those graphs corresponds to information that there was a piece of DNA of a particular size associated with the sample 
that was being tested. Um, so ultimately, when you're interpreting DNA test results, you can start off by doing some chemistry to generate the DNA profile, but you really only visualize the DNA on these electropherograms. And to a large extent, the information on the electropherograms can be reduced down to two things. The, the name of the peak, right? So each peak, software will tell us, gives a name to each of the different peaks that you might see in an electropherogram, and then the height of the peak. Uh, the height of the peak corresponds to how much of that DNA was present in the sample. So in a mixed sample where you've got DNA from two people, maybe one person's giving five times as much DNA as another person, the major contributor will have peaks that are five times taller than a minor contributor's. And you can start to tease those sorts of things apart when you're looking at those electropherograms. I often teach the introductory freshman biology course when I ask the students in that class what they want to do when they finish with their undergraduate education. Odds are they're going to say they're going to be a physician. They, they plan on going to medical school. At least half, sometimes two thirds of a big class will, will say that's their final destination. I, th I think what happens is as they over the course of two, three, four years of studying, uh, they realize there's, there are other options out there as well that might be more interesting or more fulfilling for them. And so quite a few of the students that I interact with do end up working in crime laboratories. Some of them go on to work in dentistry and veterinary science, you know, public health. A lot of environmental science students find that the techniques that we use to generate DNA profiles, those same approaches are very useful in terms of assessing environmental impacts. And so you go out to a polluted site and you can use DNA information to determine the extent to which the site's been polluted and the extent to which it's been remediated. So, you know, the sky's the limit. There's, there's, there's very little in terms of what's constraining you once you get that good, solid uh, training in biology.